helpful. Okay, so now we're going to turn to the panel discussion, which is going to be co-chaired by myself and Sarah Parker. Um, Sarah is just joining us off the study section from the NIH. So um, I'm going to do the introductions and then um, hand over to Sarah. And I'll join in, of course, because um, I'll always have a couple of questions. So first of all, first off, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Professor Jenny Van Eyck, um, who we heard from just there earlier. She's the Chair in Women's Heart Health and the Director of the Advanced Clinical Biosystems Research Institute. She's an international leader in the area of proteomics, um, which is a combination of tools, um, as you heard from Dr. Acorse, for example, that allows us to understand what's going on in disease at the protein level. So Jenny has used proteomics to advance her understanding of heart disease and particularly heart disease in women. And just to give you an idea of her, her renown, she's again been um, elected or made it into the power list, the analytical scientist power list for 2021, um, which recognizes you know, the most influential analytical scientists. So congratulations, Jenny. Delighted to see you on there. Um, so, uh, Professor Anand Karamanchi is the Chair in Vascular Biology and the Director of Renal Vascular Research at CEDARS. Um, his work is focusing on hypertensive disorders and particularly preeclampsia, and he's numerous awards and accolades for his uh, work in these areas. And um, a lot of his work has um, really led to the discovery of biomarkers, which define women who are at risk for preeclampsia, um, and has also um, led to a diagnostic test um, which has currently been um, investigated further. And then Professor Clive Swenson is the founding, uh, the fa uh, founder and director of the um, Regenerative Medicine Institute. And he's a pioneer in the use of stem cells to model and treat various different diseases and um, particularly neurodegenerative disease. Um, his work um, has, focused, has, has focused on stem cells and how you use them to basically make um, you know, either a patient on a chip, so you can basically model um, organs and disease processes using stem cells, and also how you can modify stem cells for patient treatment. And he was actually, his work was featured in the cover of National Geographic in 2019, which I wasn't aware of. And Clive, I think it would be great if you could circulate that, um, that article, because I couldn't get access to it, unfortunately. Um, for their pioneering work, pioneering work on patient on a chip, and actually has a you know kind of a really catchy nickname, which I also found today, which is um, stem seller, which I wasn't aware of. <laughs> so with uh, those introductions, um, we're just going to build on um, the uh, the lecture that uh, Dr. Schiebinger gave there, which beautifully um, you know highlighted the importance of doing um, women's health research, but also the personalized approach that we need to take to this. And so um, the first question I want to ask you guys and kind of the first thing to set the scene is really what precision health means for you and what it means for your research. And Jenny, I think we'll, we'll, we'll kick start off with you or kick off with you. Oh, well, thank you. And first of all, I'm, um, I'm, I'm blushing because uh, the, the power list just came out uh, today. So um, thank you. Uh, so I think um, for me, it's two sides of the same coin. And I think it's many reasons why we're all of us are here at CEDARS. I think it's both personalized diagnostics, being able to find those individuals who are at risk or to be able to monitor them over their, their life type. But there's also the other side, which is to take that concept and say, we therefore have to have individualized therapies. And I'm not sure we're at the point yet where we have enough therapies out there uh, to individualize them, but that's the goal, right? So it's the two sides. And I think that's what most of us are trying to deal with either one or the other or together. Clive, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I guess precision health to me is also about prevention. I mean, you tend to come to the hospital when you get sick. And I see a future where we won't need hospitals anymore because you, through precision health, <clears throat> understood about what, you know, what the risks and the genetics and the environment is that's going to be lead to your particular disease. And I think the, the way to get to that is through these precision health technologies that we're developing at CEDARS. So it's very exciting that you could categorize patients much better based on their genome, you know, based on the proteome, Jenny, <laughs> and based on other features. Um, and that requires a precision health uh, method. And I've, I predict that pretty much a lot of us have our genome sequenced. Um, 
I think within the next five years, everybody will have their genome sequence. So when you come to the doctor, they'll get the iPad out and they'll say, could you give me your sequence? Um, so that'll be the precision health start. And then we get more and more actionable, actionable items from the, med from the medical field as that moves forward. And then we'll bring in these proteomics. Finally, we'll, we'll bring in, because my, I guess, what was I called? The stem, stem seller? Stem seller. That sounds hor horrible. Either I live in a cell <laughs> or I'm selling stem cells. Either way, it doesn't look good. Um, but iPS cells is technology where we can make a patient's own stem cell line and then turn it into beating heart cells or, or liver cells or kidney cells. It gives you ability to read out what that precision health thing might be and even add a drug to see if you could correct it before it actually happens. So that's my kind of vision. Anant? Yeah, so I was going to say, as a, 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 a from a physician standpoint, I, I think when we think about precision health, the most diseases are heterogeneous, uh, with a lot of genetic and environmental influences that make uh, diseases um, quite heterogeneous, and different people have different, um, you know, uh, you know, phenotypes of the same disease, but also responses to different drugs. The question is, can we use some of these, uh, uh, you know, omics technologies to try to homogenize the patient population to find a very specific pathway. I, just to give you some examples in my own life, for example, when I was in medical school, we would have, we would just do glomerulonephritis and everybody would get the same drug. So it was now we have a specific test, let's say an anchor test for a very specific kind of glomerulonephritis. You can do a very specific chemokine inhibitor uh, you know, therapy for those conditions. And the same drug doesn't work for other glomerulonephritis. So the idea of sort of, could you take a, a disease that has very common phenotypes but uh, but essentially, can you use these uh, omics type of technologies to find specific pathways, and then you can target those specific pathways? Obviously, the the the, the biggest advance in this field has largely been in the cancer field. You, know, you take a HER2 new positive breast cancer, you give Herceptin. So you want to try the same sort of analogy uh, in most common diseases. Um, that's one thing. But if you go all the way, what Clive was talking, you could even talk about an autologous cell cell based therapy for a given patient. You can take the cells out, maybe even fix it and put it back, and the cells could secrete molecules. And that's sort of very, sort of futuristic. But uh, yeah, I think that um, you know we're right there. We've got all the technologies for your patients. And I think um, you know it's time to sort of uh, you know try to figure these out. Thank you, and hello everybody. I'm I'm really happy to be here. I'm on the crew steering committee, but I had to I had to review grants today, so finally got to join the symposium. Um, thank you, Anant and Jenny and Clive for getting us started and kind of hopefully defining for, for this group, for those who are, who are maybe less versed in this, what, what we mean when we talk about precision health. Um, I think I'd like to dive into each. So I heard, you know, modeling of disease, um, you know, from Clive's perspective, a patient in a dish. I heard diagnostics from, from, from Jenny and, and Anant and Anant also therapies. Um, so maybe can we dive in a little bit to each of those? Um, and so we'll start with diagnostics. Um, you know, you think about sex differences and you know, women versus men, and this seems like the, you know, this is the biggest simple divider of individuals. So when we think about individual medicine, sex is kind of the first thing to look at. Where are we meeting that challenge and where are we falling short when it comes to precision approaches to diagnostics first and then, and then maybe the others after that? And uh, uh, Jenny, do you wanna start with that, with diagnostics? Yeah, so Sarah knows because Sarah and I often talk about this and um, really the challenges and lack thereof. So the, the answer to that is no, um, other than outside of the things like pregnancy and preeclampsia, which we've already heard from the one of the speakers that this is still not well done. And, but yet even just in cardiovascular disease, you know, so I think there's so many things that's missing in it. And to me, where, um, where we have to get to, of course, because I on the side of technology and the application of technology to medicine is I really believe we have to just increase our numbers of everything from the basic science research to the populations. Uh, we need to be doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples and we need to make that cost effective data easy to analyze so that we can get that high quality data just on large swath of populations, including women and children and aging and just ethnicity so we can start to really analyze this. So my goal is to make it cheaper, better, quantitative, reduce the barriers to get that data and then help open the barriers to get the, um, the ability to get that data into things where we can understand it and ultimately in, up into the EHR. So I think there's a long ways to go, but we have to get there. 
So, right. So money and recruitment, one big barrier. Another one that comes to mind for me, and, I, and maybe Anant, you can speak to this, is, I mean, just the complex complexities of, of the physiology. You know, if you're, if you're looking at diagnostics for a female, how often might, um, you know, phase in the cycle come into play? And are we, are we taking that into account enough in our, in our methodologies and especially like our computational algorithms? If you, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, just, just yeah, off no, the I think top that, of your head. I, I think you, you make an excellent point. I think one of the problems uh, with these type of studies is that we don't do deep phenotyping. Uh, so in other words, as, as um, you know, we sort of say like, let's say I take preeclampsia and I just, you know, ask the ICD-9 code and study preeclampsia. Maybe ha ha if you do deep phenotyping of those patients, um, half the patients, even the diagnosis may be incorrect. That's what's in the charts. So I think uh, uh, so it's, you have to really deeply phenotype uh, the cohorts as much as you can, because once you phenotype the patients as well, then it's easier, uh, you know, to apply a lot of the proteomics or genomics. I think a problem with this, uh, with, with generally a lot of this field is that we don't do, you know, it costs money to do the phenotyping. And so it's not an easy thing to do. So I would say that that's an area that where at Cedars, we could, um, you know, spend more time to think about how do we uh, assess the cohorts and, you know, how are we doing deep enough phenotyping so our phenotypes are accurate because the phenotypes are not accurate then it's sort of like garbage in garbage out so you could do a lot of omics technology you're not going to find much and and i think that just clinical descriptions of diseases are often incorrect um i think i, I would you know go back to oncology um i think nowadays they don't even talk about an organ specific cancer you can have a drug like pd1 therapies that are approved for DNA mismatch, uh, mismatch repair gene mutation so it's really a drug approved for a specific pathway it doesn't matter what cancer is. So the same sort of situation could apply here where we could you know, identify women based on a pattern of uh, molecules or pathways that mediate rather than a, a sort of loosely defined disease, uh, which I think that's just a problem. I think a deep phenotyping has always been a problem there. Clive, did you have anything you wanted to add on diagnostics? I kind of, I kind of want to take the discussion a little bit further on. And something that I think is shocking is clinical trial outcomes, not really diagnostics, but drug giving drugs. I know I'm taking it in a mm -hmm. slightly different direction of the discussion, but it's so important. You do a clinical mm -hmm. trial and you try and, you know, get even numbers of male, female, but how often do you, do you then dissect the data afterwards to say, did the female population or the male respond to that particular drug? And there's a number of articles, JAMA and New England Journal, that says actually that's been done in, in a, less than 10% of clinical trials, which is amazing when you think about <laughs> How many times a drug might have worked in just the female group or just the male group? I think that's a massive gap in the literature and in our knowledge base. And you could actually proactively go back respectively and look at these trials and maybe there are drugs which work well in the male group and not the female. I don't know, but I might be wrong. Maybe Noel and others know more about this because it seems to me that would be an obvious thing to look at in more detail, given what we just discussed, the differences in biomarkers in men and women. So I just want to bring that up as a topic as well as... Uh, it, yeah, is, like, it is actually now required by the FDA. There's a publicly available website called Snapshots. And any this, um, this came down probably eight years ago uh, that, um, you know, there was a big outcry to what Clive just said. And there was public lobbying and advocacy and Margaret Hamburg started it. Uh, and so now it's available and it's open for criticism, meaning there are policies for drug, uh, you know, approval, FDA policies, which are not followed. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we all have to look at snapshots and we have to object to it when it is insufficient, but it is better than it was. And I, asked Margaret if it shouldn't be retrospective. And she said, oh, that's way too expensive. <laughs> money again, it's the money again. But retrospective, <laughs> right. you could learn so much, right? If you look back at the trials, not, not so much that we should in, be inclusive, obviously with new trials, that's for sure. I'm thinking about looking at trials already done and see if there was an effect that we missed. Well, and that raises an interesting point that actually was just brought up in the chat by um, Gideon here. So asking, you know, interested to know about data ownership and, you know, all of the information that supports precision medicine, but really also all of these clinical trials. Um, and, and Gideon's asking, 
you know, who we think owns it, owns this data, and in the future, given the range of, you know, private uh, groups also taking on precision medicine um, endeavors, what kind of government support or legislation is maybe needed to help support our efforts? Um, have any of you met with barriers yet trying to access data sets or you know, has this come up in your own work trying to get at um, a, a deeper amount of information access? Very briefly, and I'll let uh, Anath and Jenny uh, mention this as well, but I, I think it's impossible to get, I and mean, this is the, the yin and yang, right? I just said, oh, it's easy. Just go back and prospectively <laughs> look at all these studies. You have to have access to their data and drug companies do not want you to have access because <laughs> if it worked, they don't want you to find out it didn't. Uh, if it didn't, they just want to bury it. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's probably the big gap. And if FDA or the federal government said as part of the trial, you know, you should open up this data for post analysis and maybe we could do some of those kinds of things. But I don't know, Anath? Yeah, I would agree with you. I, I've had difficulty, particularly pharma funded trials to get the data. Um, you know, if you wanted to do an analysis, it take, it, it's a lot of hoops to get through. Even, even the NIH trials, um, it's quite hard to get the data. Um, even though we have all this data sharing policies, it's it's significantly better. Um, but I can tell you also being on the other, uh, being on the side of uh, uh, on the side of an editor of a journal, um, you know I've had problems where people are looking for data and then they complain saying the paper should be retracted because the authors won't give give out the data. So I you know this is there's no right answer. I, I think the people who have done the trial want to keep the uh, data for themselves so they can publish many more many more papers. They feel like giving out the data sooner means that they don't have a first shot to handle it. So I think this is a debate that has to be happened, but I would agree data sharing uh, of at least published clinical trials should be available, um, you know, particularly for some of the things that you've said, uh, Clive, uh, for some, some of the subgroup analysis that people could, uh, you know, start looking at. I'm just going to chime in here. I'm just so surprised that industry hasn't taken this one on and, you know, themselves and, and to start looking at the data and start making sure that the clinical trials are properly represented across, across the sexes and now across the genders, especially with respect, with respect to cancer research. Um, you know, I mean, that the, the studies that have come out in cancer and the, um, the use of the checkpoint inhibitors and, and the, the finding that women respond to one of the checkpoint inhibitors um, but not to the other, uh, but you know, that, that data came out seven years later and you know, that's, that's criminal to be honest. Um, and I, I just don't understand why the approach isn't been taken proactively um, from the, from the get go, because it would certainly save a lot of drugs um, that are then binned because they're deemed unsafe, so. The standard answer from industry, and this came out in the Ambien, the, you know, the soccer moms that were driving drunk the next morning because it was a male dose. And they, and they had data that females should have been dosed lower. Um, and it came out not seven years later, 12, 14 years later. But the, um, this was on that 60 minute segment that, uh, Professor Scherbener was telling us about, um, the, the manufacturer said it is more expensive to do specific dosing. And we kind of challenged them on that um, because you know there are lots of examples that drugs have been repurposed for something else and then they sell twice as much. Um, and you know the idea that the American consumer sort of likes personalized medicine, uh, you know, potentially would make sense to to a lot of people. So I'm not a health economist, but you know this is probably an area we should do some research and show them the ROI or the lack thereof, and then it'll just boil down to regulation, because as you say, it, it's it's really criminal. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 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 a that's a strong point, and it kind of brings us even more into the, the drug development stage and efficacy of the drug, clearly a critical important element that's affected by sex. Um, but then there's also issues of dosing and then side effects and me metabolism of the drugs and all of these elements can be affected. How can the, you know, the new focus on precision approaches, how can this help um, help do better by women in terms of, of, of drug development and drug targeting. Let's see, Anand, do you want to 
Try taking well, that one first. It, it's a hard one because I think that, uh, but some of these things like what, uh, you know, Clive has been doing, for example, organ on a dish uh, kind of things could predict toxicity. So you could, you know, you know, it's hard to sort of uh, uh, spend million, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to sort of figure out data in, 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 um, in real patients. And if you could sort of cut down the cost in some of these, um, uh, you know, in, in intermediates, um, whether it's animals or even human uh, organs on a dish, um, you know, to try to get at some toxicity, uh, that would be very useful. So, we'll, you know, I, I'm you know, to develop a drug in pregnancy, for example, you want to make sure the drug doesn't cross into the fetus. And, and that, you know, it, it's obviously tens and uh, maybe fifth, hundreds of millions of dollars to do large clinical trials. So if you can get at some of that stuff in vitro, but some of these or, or organoid type of, uh, 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 you know, testing approaches, that might save money. Uh, but the, I would agree with you. Yes, the metabolism in women are different for drugs. The, as a result, the side effect profiles can be very different. Uh, you also make a point that there may be subgroups uh, you know, where it may be uh, particularly beneficial. Um, and I think that you could argue that the cost of clinical trials, if you can find the subgroups where the benefit outweighs the risk, it might actually be cheaper because you were doing a smaller number of patients. But at the moment, outside of cancer, it's not been the sort of primary interest in pharma companies because they want to develop a blood pressure medicine. They want to use it for everybody. If they just restrict to a, a population, it's a smaller market. And so they don't sort of not, that's not their sort of goal. But I think this is where we need to come up and keep pushing on saying that, you know, we need data um, and maybe some of these uh, intermediates that we can uh, use to test toxicity might be helpful. I think another level that, that um, this all kind of hinges on as well, and especially for women is um, hormone levels. Uh, yeah. I mean, how that changes throughout your life and that beautiful example and um, Professor Schiebinger gave about the nano nanoparticle delivery. And, you know, whether you are um, menstruating or you were um, ovulating and where the basically the nanoparticles ended up and the efficacy of, of treatment. I mean, that was a beautiful ex example of it, but that's going to be true, you know, across our lifetime, basically, as our hormones change. So that's another area, which I'm sure the drug companies not, don't want to even look at. Um, but so, so there's, um, oh, go ahead. Please. Sorry, I was going to say that I, I think there could be, since th these experiments are not going to be done on a routine uh, basis, I wonder if um, maybe this would be another call for proposals, but using the data that we have from the EHR and looking at how women and men might fare differently and actually getting real world experience in terms of exposure to medications, side effect profiles, you know, we might be able to actually answer some of these questions that the drug companies don't want to ask uh, by looking at what's actually um, happening to uh, patients. And, and I think this is data that other industry and other people are using for different reasons and for different um, outcomes, but really um, emphasizing the fact that we should be looking at sex differences um, and us using this real world data for that could be something interesting. This is, this is very much like the uh, Nobel Prize in Eco Economics, right? Real world um, opportunistic experiments to answer these important questions that are maybe really challenging to do experimentally. So I, I think that's such, a, that's such an exciting point. Anyone on here looking to um, start up a project, this might be a really great application for next year's funding cycle. Um, and then I also think when we, um, when we get into you know, trying to predict different, different responses to drugs and, um, and the effect of hormones in intersecting with, with the biology, Clive, that kind of takes me thinking about how we model disease in vitro. Are there ways we can make our in vitro models more representative of the female paradigm? Yeah, and what's been actually astounding to me, when, I, when Ali came into my lab, she brought sexual dimorphism in, in microglia and it came out beautifully in all the talks today how um, that IPS model <clears throat> she described has no hormonal influence whatsoever right so you take blood cells you reprogram them outside the, the woman's body it's in the petri dish <clears throat> and then you differentiate them to microglia with no progesterone no estrogen nothing so you've eliminated that variable if you like and yet there were still major sex differences so there's a genetic component to the sex differences, which I think you can untangle from the hormonal component, because now you can add the estrogens and progesterones and testosterones back into the system. So I think we have an opportunity with IPS to do this, and I'll give 
One more example which shocked me recently from a large study we're doing. I, I, as many of you know, I work on ALS, Lou Gehrig's, which is really the one you don't want to get. It turns out <clears throat> in ALS, um, more prevalent in men than women. It's about a 60-40 split, particularly younger men. Women tend not to get this disease until postmenopausal. Aha, right? So, and there's a real uh, protection of progesterone perhaps early on hormonally. So actually just linked to that, when we had the COVID crisis, there was a group here, Sarah and others, and Sam who, who used progesterone because it was helping COVID patients and were administering progesterone in the clinic here at Cedars to patients. Uh, so I recently met with Sam thinking about perhaps we could use progesterone in ALS because it seems to work to block it with women. Maybe we should do a trial with progesterone. And so, because they had the pathway all built for COVID, or maybe we can adapt that to ALS. Um, but it's a good example of how, you know, sex differences can, even in Nancy and my area, you know, neuroscience can really affect uh, the, the aging process and uh, things like ALS. Now, finally, the other big shocker was work I'm doing with Jenny, which is called Answer ALS. We've, We've actually taken a thousand ALS patients from across the US, made their IPS lines here at Cedar Sinai and turned all of them into motor neurons in the Petri dish. And of course we have 50% male, 50% female. And when we first started this, we, we took the first 200 lines, put them in a big PCA plot and said, right, let's look for the difference with ALS and control at the RNA-seq level as we heard earlier on from Ali. And we hoped that you know, ALS would be here and the control would be here and we'd solve the problem no, they're all merged together perfectly. No difference between ALS and control, very disappointing. But on PC3, there was this one group that completely separated, one group of genes that completely separated two major clusters. Well, it turns out one's male and the other's female, 100% separate. <laughs> and that means that at the motor neuron level, in the neuron, you could, we could determine male and female motor neurons, even though they looked identical, no hormones, nothing else, and that's probably could be to do with exon activation and some complex, but just tells you that the biology of neurons is actually very different and they're using different mechanisms for functioning, even at the neuron level. So just a few vignettes from our world and how we might be able to use that to test drugs, male and female, because they do exhibit, even without the hormones, different differences. And I think that could be important for toxic toxicology and, and efficacy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, proteo, this really, you know, underscores the power of, of omics and, and large scale molecular screening to, you know, really characterize the phenotype. Jenny, I kind of think about, um, you know, sh shortcutting the time that it takes to see whether a drug is, is showing a, a beneficial or an adverse effect. Are there other ways that omics can help us get more rapid or accurate readouts? For yeah, women? so... Yeah, so for sure. So I think this is also part of the new initiative within the concept of the innovation center, right, is to be able to move everything just to higher numbers. Like, can we take, you know, Clive's IPSCs from 95 women or 96 women or one, one woman and 96 women and do 96 perturbations, 96 drugs and come up with all the RNA and DNA and protein screens in one, one day? And what, if you could do that, what would that do to science? If you can just increase it, it gives you enough knowledge so that hopefully you could shortcut the disease. So as you know, in the precision biomarker labs, we're trying to shortcut by bringing all the expertise to go from biomarker discovery to a CLIA lab that a clinician can use. Can we do the same thing here in the concept of individualized therapies? Do it so that we can do enough perturbations and enough women um, IPS models, because I really do believe in them a lot as much as Clive does. Can we use that to build a foundation? You know, we heard about, we need really good clinical phenotyping. Oh, we do. The more the, the more we can get, the better, but we also need equal uh, depth in, in, the, in the biochemistry and the physiology at the cell level. There's a heterogeneity there that we need to capture. So I think that's actually the super exciting part coming out of uh, cedars in the next while is how can we bring this collectively as a unit and address really um, sex differences across the board and just imagine what we could do if all of this can come together so yeah I'm hopeful and, and you're part of that Sarah <laughs> yeah. well yeah I mean, I mean, I, you've all all three of you have I, I don't know about the rest of the of the attendees but I'm, I'm sufficiently excited um, I think you know there's so much we've, we've gone you know through a, a logical trend uh, tra uh, transition here from where are the problems? What are the really exciting things that we can do um, to try to address some of these problems? 
I think the, it would be great to finish on a discussion of how this group, the CRUISE initiative here at Cedars, how can we see some of these things? How can we support moving some of these into fruition, knowing that right now we're small, but we're looking to grow larger and much more impactful? What does it take? And you know, money is definitely one of the, one of the big things, um, but how, how would you all each maybe finish with how you'd advise us to help to, help, to more, help, more effectively help you? <laughs> So I'll start. So I've actually thought a lot about it because I really like Cruise. I think it's playing a really important role. Um, and I think initially it, you started really on education and training and building that foundation. And this symposium is one really important aspect of it. Bring it to shining the light on it and having the grants, I think, are really important. I think now it's time to explode it, right, to be, be bigger um, and more impactful. And I think um, it has to become a major part of the Innovation Center. I think the questions around um, women-specific diseases like breast cancer, but also um, in across all diseases, there has to be a component there of, of sex and uh, dealing with things like that. And I think there should be this continued building of the foundation, but then some spearheading push um, by all of us collectively, because we all believe it's really important. So I, I think we just, we need to help you as opposed to you help us. I think it's our, our responsibility to help you as much as possible. So educate and keep the pressure on yeah. uh, enough. What, yeah, I what was going to say thoughts? that the, uh, you know, Cedars can't be, you know, I came from Boston, you know, so we are, uh, you could always find ex experts in every area. We couldn't, you know, Cedars, we have to pick a few areas. And I think we have a lot of interest in this, uh, you know, women's health uh, initiative. And thanks to um, you know Sarah and Noel, the leadership, we've identified that this is a big problem um, that everyone should be aware. Of. And there's a lot of interest investigators now, you know, co coming together. We're hearing about each other's uh, diseases uh, that people are working on. People are collaborating. New collaborations are happening. And I think we just got to put push to the leadership that this is a major area where theaters should be uh, leaders in the country uh, in this space. And, and I think we have a lot of, you know, prominent people here. Um, and I think that we've, you know, a lot of that comes from just, you know, publications, grants, but also showing that we are leading in this area um, across not just, you know, cardiovascular medicine, but, um, you know, neurology, stem cells and uh, in all the different fields. I, I think that this could be an area where we could, uh, cedars could shine uh, in the country um, as one of the areas where we are sort of experts or number one in the, number one in the country. So market ourselves. <laughs> so Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll just finish up. I mean, it's been yep. said pretty much uh, already, but I have to say that, that, that what got me interested in this uh, I don't know, eight years ago was when Noel gave a talk and I just like this. And well, it was in the real days, Noel, when you could actually see you uh, physically. And you talked about women's heart and how different it was. And to be honest, I felt embarrassed leaving that talk. Thinking, Why didn't I know women's hearts are different between male and female in, in heart disease? And that really shook me up and I'm like, wait a minute. And in fact, that led to a lot of the stuff we're doing now, Noel uh, and Sarah, you, the way you've, you've promoted this at Cedar is such a great way. I think we've become a world leader in this area and I think uh, we should double down. I think we should institutionally make this a huge effort because it's a major flaw, right? That, that <laughs> it isn't being appreciated. And I don't know why, I don't really understand why, but I think we could fix it here. And, and, and I'm just, you know, it's such a nice to be, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, invited to this group and, Give the uh, give the and help the panel and uh, more of it. I think that's what we need. More of this in the future. Well, I will point out uh, uh, that we have all of your what you all three of you just said taped. So we're. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, since we're recording these, um, I would just add uh, to emphasize what Jenny said because I think it's really um, important that we blow it up and we integrate this idea into all of the different institutes and. You know, clearly it's in heart. I assume in cancer they're doing this, but I'm thinking about the computational biomedicine or forgetting the name of the new uh, department. But what a great opportunity to, from the ground floor, like using that, um, those approaches to address this and, and uh, thinking about it just to integrate the, you know, thinking about male, female differences and gender differences across the board. Um, throughout the institution. I mean, on the neuroscience side, as you heard, 
from Clyde, there are sex differences in a lot of these uh, neurological conditions and Alzheimer's disease uh, affects uh, women two thirds of the time and men a third of the time. And, and that's not an age related issue. And uh, a lot of the autoimmune diseases, uh, we have an autoimmune disease um, area, uh, are gen are, have gender bias. So, you know, if we just have that as part and parcel of what we do, it could be very powerful. And, and uh, I like what Ananth was saying that this would be something to be a differentiator for us um, across the country. I think that's inspiring. And Nancy, I think we've started, you know, kind of that process to bring, um, you know, women's health research to that level with respect to data analytics. And so, you know, Jeff Golden's aware of it, you know, we've, 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 you know, the CRUISE um, application for the K-12, their career development program. And that was all based on um, data analytics and, and precision health. So, um, you know, I think, I think we're, we're on that track, which is great and great to get the endorsements from everybody today, because I, I think it's, it's a, a critical area that CEDARS really should be, you know, um, capitalizing on because we're getting the research, we're, we're getting the grants, uh, we have two grants or ones from the Office of Women's Health Research in the last couple of years, and we can absolutely get more of them. So, yeah, I think we're 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 getting there. This is Kim. I think that if you guys are going to start um, collecting specimens, it would be especially in light of the first lecture. It would be prudent to include the um, transgender um, department. And especially collecting specimens over time, because you might be able to really see some interesting phenomenon there. We, we're actually, I just came from a meeting, it was about um, a specimen collection and a biorepository just on that, Kim. So it's definitely, definitely in the works. Well, this has been, I think, an incredibly stimulating and also a motivating discussion, I hope. I hope everybody else feels the same. In the interest of time, I'm gonna to have to wrap it up for now, um, but hope that we can continue a lot of these ideas um, as we look to grow for our next year um, with, this, with this group and, and with this institution. Um, thank you so, yeah. all three of you, it was, really, it was really great. Thank you, thank you, thank you.